Hey, business building warrior, welcome to Silent Sales Machine Radio. I'm your host today, Jim Cockrum. And this, of course, is the podcast family of people who are using the internet creatively to launch and grow multiple streams of income with a focus on creative Amazon opportunities. It's a global audience that listens to this show. I was just checking the statistics today. We've got about 120,000 people on iTunes alone who downloaded and listened to this show in the last 30 days. That's pretty awesome. We blew past 5 million downloads here a couple months ago. So we love that you love this show. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, hi, you can see me. Most of our listeners, most of the consumers of this show, I should say, only listen to it on their favorite podcast app. But it's great hanging out with you no matter how you're listening today. And the topic, as you probably saw in the title today, is some of those gray areas that we've observed where it takes a more nuanced answer to address the situation, the challenge, the opportunity, the question that you have. And you'll see a lot of conversations in our free Facebook group on these topics because they're very nuanced situations for the most part. Some of them people think are nuanced when really you should be avoiding them entirely. And others, people avoid them entirely when really there's a nuanced opportunity involved. So it's some of those fun conversations. This is one of those episodes where I probably could have had another guest or two, some experts, coaches from our team, but it's such a popular topic. I thought I'm just going to pound through the list and maybe we'll bring some other people on board at some point and go deeper on some of these. On many of these topics that I'm going to introduce in just a moment, you've heard me discuss them with Jeff Schick, who is a great sponsor of this podcast. He's also our foremost expert on all things Amazon policy and legal. He's going to be at our event, our conference in July. Plan to attend us if you can, attend with us. It's July 6th through 8th in Columbus, Ohio. The website is The Proven Conference. You can go get a lot of details about the event and what you can expect. But he's going to be there doing some sessions with us. A lot of the things that I've learned in regards to how we should handle this list that I'm going to give you <laughs> has been from him, from observing literally thousands and thousands of sellers. What kinds of things can get you in trouble on Amazon? What kind of things are safe that people think are dangerous? And what kinds of things are people completely ignoring opportunities they could very easily have a part of their business, big opportunities that they're possibly ignoring. So let's go through this list and that will help you figure out maybe some of the big risks you're taking that you weren't even realizing you're taking and some of the opportunities you might be ignoring. Now, when I say this list is nuanced, for some of us, if we're more experienced sellers, the risks are fairly low. Whereas if you are brand new, the risks are fairly high for some of these activities. So that's what requires the nuanced conversation as we go through this list. So let's just hit the list real quick. And I will uh, then go through them one at a time. So the things I'm going to talk about today, I think it's a top 10 list. I'm looking at this, which we'll explain in the notes as well what the topics were. So you can refer to that. If you've got the show notes near where you're watching or listening, you can kind of follow along. But I'm going to talk about buy lists. That's when people do the research for you and say, hey, here's the hot items you should go buy. Talk about buy lists. I'm going to talk about selling products that don't quite look like exactly what's being sold on Amazon. When's that okay? When isn't it okay? I told you, these are nuanced topics. It's going to be fun to go through these. Drop shipping. There's another nuanced one for you. Can I drop ship? Should I? Shouldn't I? Who can? Who can't? Who should? Who shouldn't? Is it a policy violation? Let's go through it. Selling items that have been sourced by others. I'll have to explain what I'm talking about there in a minute, but that can be pretty risky territory. Scanning clearance aisles, scanning barcodes, looking for great deals, selling closeouts, liquidations, that sort of thing. Next, selling books. Let's talk about selling books and why we have a very nuanced answer to, should I sell books on Amazon? We'll dive into that a little bit. Next, selling seasonal items. Got a nuanced answer for you there. And next, shoes and clothing. Any shoes, any clothing on Amazon, let's talk about it. Why some people are super excited about it and love it, and other people are very bummed out about it and very negative on that. Next, bulk discounts. Yeah, bulk discounts. Well, if I can buy one for 
$10, surely I can buy 10 for $80. And that means I can buy, you know, a, a hundred for an even cheaper price per unit. That means I need to buy as many as I can to get those discounts, right? Well, nuanced answer coming at you. Next, storefront stocking to find ideas of what you can sell. That seems to be a, a gray area that would be fun to dive into as well. So let's dive in to the list in the order I gave it to you. There's no particular order here. I think some of the more interesting ones are towards the middle of the list from my vantage point, as far as being able to provide you with everything you need to know to make a good decision for yourself on what your risk tolerance is and how you can properly handle some of these. Uh, some of the things on this list, they're great if you handle them the right way. They're a disaster if you don't. <laughs> Thus, the nuanced approach to answering these questions. All right, so let's talk about buy lists. That's the first one. Jim, should I use a buy list? Here comes a post popping into the Facebook group. And all of these, by the way, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to find multiple opinions even on each of these inside our free Facebook group. Now, what you will see is you'll start to see a consensus among those of us who have been doing it a while. It's pretty rare that those of us who have, say, five, seven, eight years experience of selling physical products on Amazon would give you nuanced answers that don't quite line up with each other. We may say, hey, if you're new, here's some advice. If you've been doing it a while, here's some slightly different advice. Buy lists falls into that category. Can I say, hands down, absolutely never use a buy list? Well, if I've got 15 seconds with you in an elevator, that's what I would probably say. Learn to find your own great inventory. It's so much better than lists. You've probably heard me say things like this before. If you're buying a buy list from somebody, you're paying them money, and they're providing a group of people, 5, 10, 15, 50 people, get this list, like, hey, here's the hot inventory, go buy this stuff. That list is getting shared and reshared and compiled with other lists and sold and resold. If the list is any good at all, someone's buying it just so they can resell it to other people. That's a great way to get yourself caught in this cycle where you're going out and buying stuff that looks great and you're sending it in and it still looks great. And then it gets checked in two weeks later at Amazon and it's not looking so great anymore. And then you start looking at the numbers a month out, <laughs> six weeks out and the price is cut in half and there's 50 sellers where there used to be four or five sellers. How'd that happen? Well, you're probably selling stuff that somebody put on a buy list at some point. And a whole lot of people who think they found the magic pill to succeeding in Amazon, well, they've jumped in and used that same buy list. And there you go. Maybe it's a sale at a popular nationwide chain and, and every store in the United States put the exact same item on sale at the exact same time. And now who you are rushing out and buying a lot of it, along with 50 other people, and you think that you've got the holy grail. Well, you figure out very quickly you don't. If you're new to selling on Amazon, we give all new sellers the same advice. Learn replans. 99% of all new sellers should be learning Amazon replans. And I won't spend a lot of time giving you the evidence as to why that is. I could make a whole lot more money trying to sell new sellers into private label. There's a lot of people that do that, selling these two to five, $8,000 courses to new sellers, teaching them how to launch their own private label product. But we're watching those companies and that philosophy kind of crash and burn and implode on itself right now in the industry because so few people are actually able to succeed. We see about a 5% success rate in the industry is my estimation of people who put in tens of thousands of dollars hoping to launch a private label product, but then it crashes and burns. We have a very different approach. We say start with replans. Well, a lot of times people start with replans. They start off with the reselling model and they grow into beautiful things from there. That's the hundreds of stories that you've heard on this podcast. You can go hear them. You don't have to believe me. Go listen to 10, 15, 20 episodes of this show. You're going to hear numerous examples, recent examples of people doing just that. But a lot of times when people jump into replans, they're looking for that easy button, that quick fix, that just tell me what to buy. Somebody tell me exactly what to go buy. And it's very appealing to get into one of these buy lists. But my rule of thumb is until you're selling about $10,000 worth of inventory per month on Amazon, don't even think about a buy list. Don't even touch it. Don't even consider it. Every buy list out there is a complete waste of your time, effort, and energy. Don't touch it with a 10-foot pole, as we like to say. Now, once you've moved into more advanced selling strategies and you understand the replants model and you're finding your own great ASINs and you're able to do the research yourself, you can use these same buy lists 
as a research starting point. You can do some rabbit trailing with them, perhaps. You can pick up the older lists and see how they're looking. Get some ideas, generate some brand ideas. But there's no need for you to do that as a new seller. You should not be paying anybody for leads if you're new to selling replans. You simply must learn to find them yourself. You must appreciate the process. You must appreciate being able to evaluate an ASIN, a listing, and deciding if it's one that you want to spend some time on or not. So that's my advice on buy lists. Good for some. Really, really, really bad idea for most. That's why I typically say, again, I'll try to give you my little elevator pitch for each of these. If you're new, stay away from buy lists. If you're experienced, approach with extreme caution and be aware that the really good ones are probably going to get saturated and the really bad ones, well, you got no use for those, right? So buy lists, we're not really excited about them around here. On my team, we don't use them at all, just so you know. All right, next, selling products that look different than the Amazon listing. This is a fun gray area topic where you probably could hear a few different experts, seasoned veterans and pros with a few slightly different answers. The short elevator pitch answer here is, if it looks different, if it looks different enough that the customer is going to be bothered by the differences, yeah, you probably shouldn't sell it against that listing. Now, let me give you a little background here. You may not even know what I'm talking about yet. Let's say you've got a 15-ounce cleaning product on Amazon that is a great-looking ASIN and you're eligible to sell against it. And you go to the store and there's the 15-ounce version of this product. But instead of having a red, white, and green label, it has a red, white, and purple label. You're like, whoa, okay. Check the ingredients, check the size, check the contents. Everything's identical, but the label's a little different or the bottle's shaped a little differently than it used to be. Same number of ounces, 15 ounces. Don't make the mistake of selling an 18 ounce version when the listing says 15 ounce. You want to make sure it's the exact same size. That's a game ender if it's not the same size, same product, same ingredients listed in the same order, whatever. It has to be identical. But the packaging, yeah, that can be a little different and you're going to be just fine. We do that all the time. The key is how likely is the customer to complain having received this item? And if you're thinking, man, you'd have to be pretty picky to be worried about a purple stripe where there used to be a green stripe. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Don't get so caught up in that little tiny bottle difference, that little color change, that label change. Sometimes they'll have a, a little, you know, burst symbol on their sticker or something that's like, you know, new and improved and like nothing's changed. You look at it and it's like, there's it's the exact same product as six months ago, guys. Some call it a marketing gimmick on the label, right? Same product. Don't sweat it. Send it in. If it's a match, the ingredients, the size. And some people say, well, if the barcode matches, you're good. Well, you know, I've we've sold different barcodes. It's the same product with a different barcode. Now, what you don't want to do, getting into the nuanced answer here is, let's say it's products that was intended to be sold in Canada and it's got a little bit of French writing on there somewhere, distributed by some French Canadian company, and it somehow made it across the border into the United States and now you're trying to sell it in the U.S. Same product, same size, same everything, Jim, just like you said. Well, no, it was intended to be distributed in a different country. That product very well could get you into some trouble. And you'll see a lot of that when you do something else that's on my nuanced list of be careful gray areas. And that's when we get down to talking about buying closeouts and liquidations. Sometimes you'll see stuff make it across the border and you should not be selling it in a country that it was not intended to be sold. And if you try to sell against a listing on Amazon with something that wasn't intended to be sold in the country that you're selling it in, well, yeah, Amazon will have a problem with that. But if it's just a little label change in the same market, they've changed the barcode, changed the label a little bit, changed the bottle size or the shape, whatever, you're going to be just fine. As long as the customer doesn't complain, you are good to go. So that's selling different looking products, different looking labels and color products against ASINs on Amazon. I tend to go for it. I tend to take little risks here. Knowing the worst case scenario is I might have to eat a month's worth of inventory and bring it back and do something else with it. Because remember, one of the rules of thumb when selling as a replen seller, which that's what most listeners to this episode today are, we're talking about the replens model, the basic model of selling on Amazon. 
One of the rules is you never have more than a month's worth of inventory in stock at Amazon. There's no reason to. You don't want to go any deeper than that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's talk next. Number three on our list, drop shipping. Drop shipping. That's one where, again, I've got 15 seconds on an elevator and you say, hey, Jim, what's your thoughts on drop shipping? I'm going to say, don't do it. Stay away from it. Especially if you're new to selling physical products, don't even think about it, mister. You've got no business whatsoever. If you're listening to somebody who's got a course they're trying to sell you or a service or a done for you and it's going to be drop shipping, run, hide your wallet, hold it, block that person from your email and get out fast because drop shipping is going to be a disaster for you. The only people I've ever met who are doing drop shipping at scale successfully are people who are trying to get out of it. <laughs> because the margins are abysmal. The headaches that come with it are horrible. We've had a couple of them on the podcast over the years that we've interviewed. Dropshipping at scale doesn't work. The only way it does work, here's the nuanced answer. Uh, and, and just for a point of reference, uh, we did, I checked our numbers a couple of days ago, we did just under $60,000 in total sales drop shipping in the past 90 days on eBay. Well, Jim, you just said don't drop ship. No, I didn't say don't drop ship. I said if you're brand new, don't do it. And it's a nuanced answer. And here's why it's nuanced. In this particular case, we've got one person, it's someone from our community, who buys big items, stuff that costs, you know, in some cases three or four thousand dollars, in some cases five to eight hundred dollars. And they're buying it and they're taking all the pictures and they're creating the listing on our eBay account and they're selling the items on our eBay account. And we get a cut of the deal. And then when the item sells, they ship it. So I'm not seeing, touching, handling the product at all ever. I'm not even setting up the listings. He's just using my seasoned eBay account. And it's a dropship arrangement. And something sells, he's the one shipping it, not me. So technically, it's a dropship arrangement. But he has the stuff in inventory. He's never going to not have the thing that he just sold. Because that's where you get in trouble. Everyone crashes and burns when they realize, wow, okay, I have things up for sale right now that I don't actually have in my possession or the ability to get a hold of. You think, well, I can just cancel the sale. Well, eBay doesn't like that. And you know who really, really doesn't like that? Amazon. They will shut you down very fast for selling stuff that you don't actually have. So technically, drop shipping is allowed. But if you ever sell something and don't have it, that's when you're in big trouble. So drop shipping simply can't be done at scale. You can't go find someone that's got 1,500 different items in their inventory and throw those 1,500 items onto your Amazon account thinking, hey, when something sells, I'll just tell them to ship it. I didn't have to spend any money on inventory. Look how smart I am. Well, no, you've just made a huge mistake that's going to destroy your Amazon account because the first couple of times that someone buys something and then you contact your supplier and say, hey, Time to ship widget X. We just sold one. And they say, oh man, we had some this afternoon, but we just sold out. Sorry, you're gonna have to wait three to six weeks before we have any more of those. So you cancel that customer's order and Amazon gives you a little slap on the wrist and says, if this happens again, you're done, mister. And they mean it. <laughs> it's a good way to lose your account. Do not drop ship if you're new. If you do do some drop shipping, you wanna make sure that you know exactly how much inventory your source has. Don't let anything be listed on your account unless you know exactly how much inventory there is right now, today, this minute. For certain, if something sells, I can ship it with confidence. That means you've got the name, the phone number, the text, you know where this person lives, they send you birthday cards, and you know their spouse's name. That kind of relationship, and it's only a few items that you drop ship. You can't do it with hundreds of items because even if you know the person really well, they can't keep in stock hundreds of different items ready for you to drop ship on your account. Simply can't be done. You can help them set up their own Amazon account perhaps, and they can do what they want there and you get a percentage. Don't put that risk on your Amazon seller account though. So that's my answer on drop shipping. My nuanced answer as we continue down to number for uh, selling stuff that was bought by others, selling items that were sourced by others. What do you mean by that, Jim? Well, there's services out there that fill warehouses with stuff and say, hey, sell anything you want, anytime you want to anybody you want. We've got it here and you can track and you know how much they have and maybe they'll even send it into your Amazon account on your behalf. Well, the trouble with that is when Amazon says, hey, we need proof that 
this product has come from a reliable supply chain. You can't provide them that proof because the only invoice that shows when that product was sourced from its originating source is that it went to someone else's warehouse. They paid for it. They were the ones sourcing it. And now they're selling it on your account. So when there's an IP complaint or a pushback, I mean, you better be able to produce an invoice or a receipt that shows you're the one that purchased it originally. So when I took possession of it, I bought it from a legitimate source. Billy Bob's warehouse is not a legitimate source. Ed's toy barn closed down shop. You know, you know, we've got discounts on everything. That's very risky territory. It just is. Now you'll hear all kinds of people saying, oh, I know these people are going to get away with it forever. Like all it takes is a couple of complaints and Amazon's locked down their entire account. All their inventory, all the money that's owed, locked down. And now you're talking months of legal struggle to get back some or part or whatever, maybe close your account down. These are the kind of things that Jeff Schick and I like talking about. And you can run it past many people. You're going to get many different answers on these types of things. But for me, the only inventory that's going into my account is stuff that I could produce a receipt that has my business's name on it or an invoice that has my company's name on it. If I can't, if I don't have that on hand right now, I'm not selling that stuff. I'm not going to let somebody send an inventory into my account on my behalf that doesn't show, this is for Amazon now, that doesn't show me as the, as the purchaser where I can look at the source I'm purchasing from and verify with the brand easily that that's a legitimate distribution channel for their products. And you've heard us talk about that before. Wednesday episodes of this podcast, pretty much every Wednesday we have at the end and, and a few minutes with Jeff Schick and we talk about these kinds of things. And he does talk about making sure that your invoices and your receipts, the places that you're buying these things, just because you have a receipt, you know, someone could run a yard sale and give you a receipt. That doesn't make them a legitimate distributor. You've got to make sure that if you contacted the brand and said, hey, is this a legitimate distributor? They would say, absolutely it is. And you've got the invoice or the receipt tied to that source. If you don't have that, you are taking big, big risks with your Amazon selling account. So be very, very careful with that, please. There's my nuanced answer for selling stuff that was sourced by other people. All right, let's talk about scanning clearance aisles, scanning barcodes, looking for discounts. A lot of people think that's what replens is. That's not what replens is. If you don't know what replens is, what replens are is, <laughs> you should go listen to a good handful of podcast episodes and hear people who are doing this business at scale very successfully. Again, hundreds of success stories, dozens of recent examples of people, even hands-free in many instances, running a replens business on Amazon at scale. It's basically just helping Amazon serve the underserved shelf space in their warehouses. That's it. And you learn how to find some of those millions of underserved ASINs. You send in a test replen. If the test goes well, you start sending in a few more and you've just created a 10, 20, 50, $500,000 a month income stream with each ASIN that you discover. Sometimes those streams dry up in a few months. Sometimes they run for a very, very long time. But you never send in more than a month's worth of anything and you're finding those test-worthy replens. That's what the Proven Amazon course teaches you how to do. That's what all of these hundreds of success stories, 1,700 tagged success stories in our Facebook group that you can go scroll through. Look in the picture area of the free Facebook group. There's a link at silentgym.com, by the way, to our free Facebook group. Get in there, look at some of those pictures, 1,700 of them plus some, it's tons from our coaching program, from our Proven Amazon course. So you need to understand replens. Sometimes people think scanning barcodes in the clearance aisle of Walmart is replens. No, that's not replens. A replen ASIN is one that you can easily go get more when you need to at the same price you paid last week, last month, six months ago, approximately same price. Prices are changing because of inflation up and down, but it's not a you know 80% off clearance item. That's not a replen because if that sells well for you, you can't go back and grab 30 more if you need them. So... Jim, are you saying we should never hit the clearance aisles? We should never scan barcodes? No, have fun with it. I like to say, don't walk past $20 bills sitting on the shelf as you're going to get groceries for your family. They're, they're sitting right there. Clearance aisle, sure, check it out. Cruise through real quick. See if there's anything that jumps off the shelf into your cart. Little $5, $10 bills laying around. That's great. But that's not a scalable business model. That's what we call an Easter egg hunt or a treasure hunt, or you might call it running on the treadmill for your business. You can't 
automate that. You can't put someone else in place to make that whole machine work. Replans, you can do that. You'll hear many stories on our podcast of people who have completely automated their replans business. They got someone doing the research for new ASINs. They got someone else doing the shopping. They got someone monitoring their account. They've got a prep center that receives all their inventory. They just watch the numbers and check in. That's what I do with my business. I swipe down on the app and reset it, refresh it four or five times a day. Probably exaggerating, more probably more like 25 or 30 a day. But still, that's how that's all I that's my contribution. The team has a question they ask me, but typically they're all smarter than I am at this point because they've been doing their jobs for a while. You can get to that point with replant. You can't do that with scanning barcodes and looking at clearance aisles. So I've got a reputation in the industry of being the guy that says, never scan barcodes. I'm like, kind of, but it's more nuanced than that. Yeah, don't walk past $20 bills, sure. But build a scalable model that you can step away from. Don't get caught on the hamster wheel of going out every Saturday and hitting all the yard sales and scanning all the barcodes and making that your only income. You simply can't scale that. You can't build a team around that. You can't step away from it and sell it as an asset someday, for example. It's just a hamster wheel of opportunities that come and go, rise and fall very quickly. Some days you make $100, other days you make $1,500. You don't know what you're going to get with that model. Now, some would argue that uh, you're crazy to walk away from all that extra opportunity that's out there. And I would tend to agree. Nathan Bailey, he's been with me for 20 years leading our coaching team. He still hits yard sales on weekends. I do too sometimes. I'll find stuff and flip it, Facebook Marketplace, whatever. It's fun, but it's not a scalable model. That's the point I want to make on scanning barcodes, hitting the clearance aisles, hitting the sales that sort of thing. And never mind the fact too, if you're selling it on Amazon, please be very careful. That's kind of a gray area. You're selling products that don't have a receipt that proved that you sourced it from a legitimate source. You could get yourself into a little bit of trouble, even if you're selling it as used. The example that Jeff Schick gave once when I was having this conversation with him was, let's say you buy a board game and uh, you know it's it's got all the pieces, looks good. You open it up, yeah, it looks great. And you... Uh, looks legit to you and you sell it on Amazon. And the next thing you know, you're getting a, a, a trademark infringement <laughs> notice. Like, what? What's going on here? Like, we want to know where you sourced this. I, I bought it from a yard sale. Well, actually, you, what you didn't realize was what you bought is a Chinese knockoff. It's, a, it's counterfeit goods. This was sent over at a pallet of counterfeit copies of this game. And it looks to the naked eye, it looks like the same. But if you notice, the paint color is different here and... You know, the logos moved here and they misspelled a few words on the back cover that you didn't catch when you're looking at it. Like, oh my gosh, I sold a counterfeit good. That's actually illegal, <laughs> right? You don't do that. So with these yard sale items, you can't be moving illegal goods. You could That could happen without you even realizing it. So just be super cautious. When in doubt, sell it on eBay, which unfortunately has a fraction of the audience that Amazon does. The reason we start people on Amazon is because that's where half of all the transactions in the United States online are happening every day. eBay plus Walmart plus the next five or 10 other most popular other websites don't even add up to a fraction of what Amazon gets every single day. So we love to start you where all the eyeballs are. We are more likely to make a lot of sales. So if you can learn to find replans and focus on that and kind of stay away from the yard sale, clearance aisle, scanning barcode stuff, the quicker you get away from that, the better, which kind of leads me to the next point. What are we at? One, two, three, four, five, six. We're on point number seven, no, six, selling books. Selling books. Well, Jim, what about books? We used to love starting people out with books. You know, you could run a little ad and you can still do this. You can run a little ad in the neighborhood Facebook group or the next door app or whatever and say, hey, I, I'm getting into selling books. If anybody wants to donate books, I'm going to donate the ones that I can't use to the local women's prison and the local homeless shelter into the, you know, the, the grade school library, but the rest of them I am going to sell. If you've got books that you don't need, your phone's going to ring. You're going to have people saying, yeah, for 20 bucks, you can come empty my attic. I got books that go way back from my great grandpa. Like get them out of here. Now you're going to be going through some other people's junk, which isn't fun. You're going to be tossing out a lot of stuff, but there's some money there, but it's a real grind. And you factor in that Amazon now charges a whole lot money for more for storage than they used to. That means you're going to want to store these things yourself. It used to be send them all into Amazon. Storage is practically free. Nah, it's not that way so much anymore. If books 
sell a little slower, you're going to get destroyed by the long-term storage fees. So don't send them in FBA. Don't expect Amazon to warehouse these things for you. You're going to have to find somewhere in your house. It's going to smell a little funky. It's going to smell a little musty. Old books just have this little funky, musty, you know, smokers had them. At some point there was mold in the house kind of thing. I'm like, get used to that, right? They're not the cleanest things to play around with. But there's some potential money there, but we're not as excited about it as we used to be. So if someone says, hey, Jim, are books a good place to start? If we're on an elevator and we got 15 seconds, I'm going to say, hmm, used to be, but probably not so much anymore. As a general rule, I'd much rather see you get into replens as a model because it's scalable. Books just aren't. There's so few people doing books at scale at this point. You'll hear the cool stories. Oh yeah, I bought this book at a yard sale for 20 bucks and sold it for a guy who collected it for 280. Awesome, that's great. What they don't tell you is the other thousand books they don't know what to do with. <laughs> like I'm just stacked up doing nothing. No one's buying these things. What do I do with these? They're taking up room in my house. It's just hard to scale. Your death pile is going to be huge with books. Death pile is all that stuff you don't know what to do with, right? As sellers of physical product, you will have a death pile. The smallest death pile is the replin sellers or even the, the people who do branded bundles and some of the more advanced strategies in the proven Amazon course. Big death piles, that's the yard sale, clearance aisle, bookseller, you know, they've got a big death pile at any given time. All the stuff that they can't send it into Amazon, they can't, don't want to pay the long-term storage fees. Surely someone will buy this someday. You know, the, the people with the biggest death piles are people who've been selling on eBay loyally for like the last 20 plus years. They've got frightening death piles. <laughs> I got away from that a long time ago. We tend to run a big, you know, spring slash summer yard sale. It, it all must go. We donate it to the food pantry. We keep our inventory moving, keep the, the shelf space as clear as we can. That's what most sellers do. We'll get back to the show in just a moment, but I have to tell you about a coaching program that's been around for about 19 years. It's coached almost 10,000 e-commerce business building warriors. It's got a team of about 60 coaches who are not only great teachers with tremendous hearts who love their students, but they're all succeeding at the business strategies that you hear taught on this show. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm talking about our coaching program. There's a link at silentgym.com. Get over there, get on our schedule, have a free consultation, zero pressure. We're going to help you build your business on that call. Sign up at silentgym.com, free consultation. See if our coaching program is a good fit for you, where you get to not only work one-on-one -on -one with one of our tremendous coaches, not only do you get that, you also get a reactive coach that you can contact at any point in time. That's a separate coach. You get all the training and content that we provide around here at no cost now and into the future. Tremendous list of benefits. I'm not going to go into all of them right now. Silentgym.com. Click on the coaching link, sign up for a consultation. Hey, let's get back to the program. They've got frightening death piles. <laughs> I got away from that a long time ago. We tend to run a big, you know, spring slash summer yard sale. It, it all must go. We donate it to the food pantry. We keep our inventory moving, keep the, the shelf space as clear as we can. That's what most sellers do. But let's get back to books. I've got a great tip for you. If you've got some books that have accumulated or you you, you just know like, man, there's got to be opportunity here. Dahlia, one of the great leaders on our team, put together a course not too long ago. You can find it. It's priced very reasonably at provenamazoncourse.com slash Safe Book Profits. That's provenamazoncourse.com slash Safe Book Profits. Put all three words together at the end like it's one big word, Safe Book Profits. I'll stick a link in the show notes as well near this audio. But basically there's services out there that will buy all your books. You just tell them what you got and they'll say, yeah, well, here's the titles we'll take. Here's what we'll pay you. So instead of waiting for them to sell one at a time, you're boxing them up and you know exactly how much money it's going to cost you to ship and what they're going to pay you and you get paid and they take your books and you don't have to worry about, oh, well, this book was actually in slightly used condition instead of brand new condition. So we got a complaint from the customer. No, they just, they buy them all, buy boxes of books. Her mom is actually making several hundred dollars most weeks from just collecting books and seeing what this but these people will pay her for it and sending them off to these book buying services. And the course talks you through 
how to do it, where the good books are, how to keep a steady stream of books coming in, what the services are that will buy them from you in bulk. They've really got it dialed in. It's a course that you can take in a couple hours. If you do that, yeah, books can be a nice little side stream of income if that's something that sounds appealing to you. Provenamazoncourse.com slash safe book profits. Go snag that course. It's a great little business model to add a new income stream if you're interested in books because a lot of people have them sitting around and it's easy inventory to track down. That's my nuanced answer on selling books. Let's move on to the next one, which is selling seasonal items. So here we are on that 15 second elevator ride and we're gonna part ways here in just a few seconds. And I only have a short time to explain my thoughts on, should I sell seasonal items on Amazon, Jim? Or in general, what do you think about seasonal? What I mean is like Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, you know, the big, the big seasonal holidays. Halloween is huge, all the masks and costumes, right? Or should I be going to the stores you know, a week after Christmas and buying all the 75% off stuff and buying and holding and storing it and then selling it next year. What do you think, Jim? What's your thoughts? Well, if we only have a few seconds, I'll say, if you're brand new, stay away from it. It's kind of a black hole that will suck you in that you may not escape from. If you've been doing this a while, you got some storage space. Sure, why not? Why not? You've got some margin. There's a 99% chance you're still going to be reselling doing things about the same way next year about this time as you are right now because you've been doing it a while. You've been doing this four, five, six, seven years. Yeah, don't ignore the seasonal. So if you're new, stay away. You've been doing it a while. Yeah, it makes sense to tack on some of those low-hanging fruit, but don't spend a whole lot of time, effort, and energy on it because there are some risks inherent to that. That's my seasonal, my take on seasonal items. You can make a lot of money fast in the fourth quarter each year, selling on Amazon, focusing on some of those seasonal items. We hear a lot of people that do it and they'll even merchant fulfill. You hear plenty of stories in our community, for example, of people that will go to a store, see an item, scan the barcode or just do some quick research and see, okay, it's selling for $30 at the store. They've got 20 of them on the shelf. I wonder if I listed this right now, what it's selling for on Amazon. Look at that. It's selling for $65, $75. Okay. I'm going to buy four of them and list them right now while I'm in the store, put them on my merchant fulfill. I don't have time to wait to send it into FBA. That can take during Q4, like December, for example. If you send stuff in December 1st, hoping you're going to sell it for Christmas, it could take two, three weeks before that stuff even hits the warehouse and gets checked in. That's too late. But you can still merchant fulfill. So here you are finding these great deals in early December. You can say, I'll do the shipping. You hear these stories of people staying up all night shipping stuff to people all over the country because they're finding these great deals and just cruising through that big spending spree of opportunity based on Christmas spending. And they're merchant fulfilling these items, meaning they're doing the shipping themselves. So you you buy those units, you put them in your cart, you're heading up to, to check out at the store They're already listed on Amazon. They're selling before you even get to the checkout counter. So as soon as you get home, you're putting them in boxes and shipping them out. That's the kind of opportunity that can be presented to you if you go after some of those seasonal opportunities, which are available in abundance. That's the reason why many of us get so excited around Q4. But we stay excited year round because Replens is filling the underserved shelf space at Amazon year round. It just so happens that during November and December, there's a spike of opportunity where if you get into some seasonal, you can make a lot of money fast. And that's where you hear people hiring a team of five people to hit every Walmart in a six state area and clear the shelf of this one item because as soon as we grab it off the shelf for 20 bucks, we know we can sell it for 55. Let's clean up. And that's seasonal, right? Am I saying don't do it? No, I'm saying it's a grind. And you're going to be in hustle mode during that season. So you kind of have to decide, do I want to enjoy December or do I want to be a seasonal research maniac and make an extra $20,000 that month by hustling? It's up to you. There's my nuanced answer on selling seasonal items. Let's talk about shoes and clothes next. What's my nuanced answer about selling shoes and clothing? Well, here's the deal. If you're willing to scan a lot of barcodes, There's shoes and clothes deals out there everywhere. You're going to have a lot of returns, though. A lot of returns. 
some people report, I think it's like 10 or 15% returns. We're not real deep in shoes and clothes, but it's a lot of returns. You get really excited and then you'll have to get all this stuff coming back. You're like, oh, okay, sell some of it on eBay. Okay, donate some of it. Okay, what do we do with all this stuff? You're going to have a significant death pile of clothes you just can't sell with selling clothes and shoes. But the margins are great. You can do really, really well with it. There are services in our community. I'll stick a link in the show notes today. I don't remember the link off the top of my head. There's services that will take your death pile from you and sell it on eBay and give you a percentage. Pretty cool business model, right? Uh, you can, you can, if you do your OA uh, prep center with them, you buy your inventory online, it ships to them and the stuff that comes back in the return, instead of going to your house, the returns go to them. Well, they will list it for you on eBay and store it for you. Pretty cool business model. So you can automate the death pile associated with shoes and clothes. But just know there's going to be a high return rate. Uh, but it is a very predictable, if you're, if you're really ready to hustle, scan a lot of barcodes, codes, or just do research on brands that are selling well. Typically, it's best to do it in a retail near you setting where you're just going through. Maybe you've got um, authorized distributors of brands at a, at a discount, you know, some kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It'll come to me. <laughs> you know, the discount warehouses where you can go and buy in bulk or, you know, they don't even, no one questions you if you buy 50 of the same thing, right? And it's like, you know, 50% off retail, but they're an authorized distributor for that brand. You want to make sure that that's the case. Outlets, that's what the word I was looking for. Those outlet centers, outlet malls and that sort of thing. There's opportunity there. It's a hustle, it's a grind, but there's people putting a lot of money in the bank doing it and you can build a team around it. You can automate a lot of that. So should I sell clothing and shoes, Jim? Well, be ready for a death pile. Be ready for the frustration of a lot of returns. But yeah, there's nice margins in that. Should new sellers jump in that? Mm, probably not. It can be a little frustrating. I'd rather see you jump into the lower hanging fruit replend models that we teach. A lot of those categories that are wide open to you on day one as a, as a new seller. The vast majority of brands in pet supplies, not pet foods, but all of the pet supplies, arts and crafts, home and kitchen, those categories are wide open. Sports and outdoor, most brands wide open. You can go in there, sell FBA, find your good replens. After you've sold 30 or 40 great replens, all those other categories, clothing, shoes, food, all the other interesting categories are going to start to be wide open. And now you've got millions of ASINs that you can sell against. All right, let's jump in. We're closing down on the list. I only got two left. Next uh, is bulk discounts. And then finally, we'll talk about store stocking, which is going to be a fun one. We've talked about these before on the show. But Jim, I found this product. And if I buy 100 units, I can get a 20% discount. And it's a good ASIN for me. I think I'm going to go ahead and buy 100 units. Is that okay? So here we are riding on the elevator and you're talking about getting bulk discounts. Instead of buying two or three at a time retail, wouldn't it be so much better if I went wholesale or bulk discounts somehow? That seems to be where the smart money is because I'm now I'm, I'm building in margin because I'm buying more units. Well, pump the brakes. One of the rules of replens, especially if you're new, is never have more than one month's worth of inventory on hand. So if you've got an item that's selling five or 10 times for you per month and it's been selling five or 10 times the last two or three months and you're relatively com comfortable and confident that it's going to continue doing so based on the pattern you're seeing, should you go buy 50 units of that product? No, you should go buy five or 10 and send it in. That means you're not going to get a lot of bulk discounts with the replens model. Even some of the best replens you will ever be on as a replen seller will be 10, 15, 20, maybe 30 units a day, or excuse me, a month, one unit per day, maybe two units per day. There's a replen because this is underserved shelf space at Amazon that other sellers can find. And eventually some of them might find it. And some of them might have sources that you don't have available to you. And they're not of a mindset where they're only buying 30 days worth of inventory at a time. They're out there bulk bargain shopping against all the other bulk bargain shoppers. So they're buying 3,000 units at a price 40% lower than you'll ever see. And one of those hops on your ASIN, instead of running to the Facebook group and crying about somebody undercutting your price, you just think to yourself, oh, that's fine. I've only got a month's worth of inventory anyway. 
I think I'll go find five or 10 more ASINs to make myself feel better. One of the rules of selling replens is you never get emotionally attached to any of your ASINs because they could be here for a few days, a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. There's no way for you to know until after it's run its course. The nice thing is, unless the product has gone out of stock and they're not making it any longer, it'll probably be back as a good replen again within a few weeks. So if you check back, say a couple months after the price dropped, the price has probably crawled back up again because whatever seller it was that went out and bought 500 units super cheap has sold through them. Because remember, replens are selling at a nice clip. You don't want to sell against slow moving replens. You want to sell against fast moving replens. So someone comes in, undercuts the price, sells through their inventory quickly. A couple months later, you come in and it's just you and all the nice sellers again, willing to make a profit at the easily sourced price that you guys are all experiencing. That happens a lot. Replens run in cycles. So when the price drops, that's just a signal for you to check back in a couple months, get rid of the inventory you have now, one month's worth, and check back soon. And the price will be back up where it was. It happens all the time, very predictable, unless, like I said, they don't make that product anymore. So bulk discounts, should I do it? Well, this is a risk question. This is a math question. Typically, in general, if you're new, don't go chasing bulk discounts. Just don't do it. You're going to get burned. You're going to get super confident and super excited about an ASIN that anybody can sell against. And off you go to buy 50 or 100 units. And before they even get to your house, 30 other sellers have jumped on that ASIN. The price has dropped by 30% and the price matches. The sell price on Amazon matches what you just paid. And you're thinking to yourself, what am I going to do with these things? I'm going to have to sell them all at a 2 or $3 loss just to get rid of them. Yeah, sell them at a loss, learn your lesson, <laughs> focus on the lesson, not the loss, and move on knowing, remembering what Jim said, never have more than one month's worth of any replant inventory on hand where you're likely to get burned with that inventory. Sometimes it'll play out in your favor though. One of my favorite stories is from a, an item that we had. It was a It was a safety item, a household safety item. And it was selling really well for us. We just went ahead and bought a full crate of like, I don't know, was it 800 units or something of this fairly small item. It was selling great for us. Only a couple other sellers. We're all making good margin. Then along comes somebody with a whole bunch of these things and just destroys us on the price. So I'm sitting here with three quarters of a crate worth, you know, like $12,000 worth of this thing. And I'm thinking, man, I wonder if they'll take it back. What do I do with this? I, don't even, I called the manufacturer. It's like, ah, sorry, it's been too long. We can't take it back. It's like, it just sat there. It was, it was kind of more of a winter item too. So like, here we are getting into spring, summer. I'm like, man, this just stinks. What are we going to do with this stuff? You know, selling a few here and there on eBay. Then suddenly we burned through the whole pallet like in a two week period because nobody had them anymore. The supplier wasn't making them as fast. They were in high demand. So we we bought it, we held it, it ended up working out. Sometimes if you just hold on to it for a little while, it ends up working out. Eventually, what happens to every fast moving item, and, and this is where you can, you know, you can end up being okay with these bulk discounts. Just because the price dropped today, man, it's gonna come back. Because if it's a fast moving item, eventually it's gonna go out of stock. Eventually the manufacturer will stop making everything and it will still be a fast mover. So if you're willing to wait until everybody else runs out of that thing and it's still ranked well on Amazon and selling well on Amazon, you're the only one that's got it. You can just creep your price up and pay for all that time you spent worrying and storing it and not sure what to do with it or thinking about liquidating it, but here you are winning. Don't do that as a strategy, but from time to time, it really pays to do nothing. Doing nothing is doing something in a lot of cases after you've made some, made some accidental big buys and you've got some extra inventory. All right, that's my short 15-second elevator ride answer. Bulk discounts, nope, not if you're new. Aren't you willing to take some risks? Yeah, but please play cautiously. If you're a replin seller, don't go more than a 30-month day supply of anything. Store stocking, what is that? I bet there's a good number of listeners today. Maybe it's you that you've never heard that term before, store stocking. What are you talking about, Jim? Well, actually, in our proven Amazon course, we teach dozens of strategies for finding underserved listings on Amazon. And one of them is just to simply look for other people who seem to be doing kind of this same business model 
serving the underserved shelf space at Amazon and look what they're selling and just research that ASIN and see if that's something that you could sell against. Is it a product you can source? A lot of times you'll find some great solutions there. Sometimes people see this as a bit of a gray area though, like there's an ethical or moral issue here. It's like, oh, I can't sell stuff that other people are selling. I want to find my own ASINs. Well, there's no such thing as your own ASIN. You're a reseller. (laughs) The only people that have their own ASINs on Amazon are people that are selling private label products. But remember, before we jump off onto the private label bandwagon, 95% of everybody there are failing miserably because they're new sellers who jumped in, didn't know what they were doing, spent tens of thousands of dollars, filled their garage with inventory they're never going to sell. So don't get too enamored with that model, guys, because it does crash and burn for just about everybody, especially if you've never made a lot of money selling physical goods on, online before. But Every listing on Amazon belongs to all the sellers. Any of us can sell against any listing unless you're the sole owner, brand registered, trademarked, locked in your product. You're the only one sending it into Amazon. Nobody else can get their hands on it. But every day, brands are battling, trying to keep other sellers off their listings, unsuccessfully so, because the laws actually protect the resellers. If you didn't know that, the first doctrine, First doctrine sale, basically, if you buy something from somebody, you now own it and you can sell it. Now, it doesn't mean you can sell it on Amazon. It doesn't mean the brand might not get grumpy and make your life miserable, but legally, you're fine. But Amazon may have rules or policies. That's why sometimes you're, you're gated or only certain sellers are ungated and they're pushing everybody else off their listings. It's just so much easier to go play on those nice replans where nobody's going to push back or care. There's millions of them. Rather than try to push back and wave the law in the face of Amazon and this grumpy brand that doesn't want you there, just ignore it, move on, let them do their thing. But those are the people that are selling their own products on their own listings. I'd say that represents maybe, I don't know, 10% of the listings on Amazon at any given time, maybe 20, I don't know. that's That's a rough estimate. All I know is there's millions of listings that you can sell against. So if you look at other sellers who are selling against multiple listings, you can get some great ideas and there's no moral or ethical or even an inconvenience there. Many people will put in four or five store names into Keepa and do the research and say, which of these ASINs look good for me? Is there anything there? Like, oh, that looks familiar. Oh, I've seen that before. Oh, that looks like a good price on that. Is that a good ASIN? Is it dropping enough per month? You learn how to read the Keepa chart. Like, oh, I'm going to go buy a three pack of that at Walmart right now because I can buy a three pack for 12 bucks at It's selling for $42, 22 drops a month, and there's only two other sellers. Yeah, I'm in. I can expect to make a good handful of sales per month on that bundle. Let's do it. So they discover listings that way. Some people say, oh, no, you should never look at the listings of other sellers on Amazon and and copy what they're doing. I say, every time you sell anything on Amazon, that's exactly what you're doing. (laughs) It's just a matter of how you found that seller, how you found that listing. We are resellers, which means other resellers can sell against it. The thing that's in our favor as Amazon resellers, though, is every day, hundreds of thousands or more of the ASINs go from being served well to being underserved or completely ignored. And once you know how to identify that, you realize that it's such a blue ocean of opportunity that nobody cares who's looking at what. As long as you're finally, as long as you're constantly looking for new ASINs, constantly adding new ASINs to your catalog as the other ones drift off, as other people find them, as new sellers come along and drop the price because they can't do math right yet and they figure it out later, that's okay. Drop my price on that ASIN, sell your inventory, learn that you're not making any money and then you'll come in at the higher price later. That's all great. That's the game. Constantly finding new ASINs. So when you're at the point where you can confidently sit down and find 5, 10, 15, 20 ASINs anytime you want to, becomes a pretty fun business model. Some ASINs are dying away. Some are are coming in. People are jumping on some of your listings. That's fine. Some crazy guy jumps on a few of your listings from a certain store, drops the price. That's fine. Sell out of your inventory. Check back in a couple months. Half those listings will be back in action again. So storefront stalking, looking at people's stores, we actually have a, a strategy it's called Advanced Keep a Sourcing. It was put together by Brian and Robin Joy Olson and our team. They put together this training that teaches you 
10, I think it's either 10 or 12 different ways to use keep at a source. And one of them is like an advanced storefront stocking strategy where you get it all under a spreadsheet. You just go step by step how to do it and how to look at other stores, see what they're selling, filter out the stuff that's of no use to you and look at the really good potential winners. You can find a bunch of great ASINs that way really fast. Hop in alongside other sellers. And remember when you're doing this, when you're hopping along as other sellers, I'm just doing this as a general service to the entire reseller community, there's no need for you to be the lowest price. That gives you a slight advantage, but it also tempts everybody else to drop their price by a penny down, 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 down. Everyone just kind of sets their reprice to go just a little lower than the next guy. And suddenly nobody's making any money. No need to do that. Jump into the middle of the buy box, make a few sales per month. That's a great ASIN. I'd much rather be the guy that's making five sales per month and putting $5 per sale in the bank than the guy that's making a thousand sales per month on that same ace and I'm putting two cents per sale in the bank. It just doesn't make any sense to be to run a that thin of a margin. It's not necessary. Play nice in the buy box with the other sellers, jump in there in the middle of the pack, watch the buy box rotate around. You have to remember this. This is a good lesson for storefront stalkers too, especially those who are hesitant saying, oh, I don't want to look at other sellers because I don't want to drive their prices down and have a negative impact on their business. Now, these are fast moving items. In some cases, there's 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 other sellers on this ace and you coming in is not going to bother anybody's business. It's all good. Actually, the more sellers and the more different warehouses where inventory is placed around the United States, the more likely that ASIN is to rise in the ranks on Amazon, more sellers are going to see it. There's a lot, excuse me, more buyers are going to see it. There's a lot more buyers out there than there are those of us who are selling stuff. So when we kind of team up on an ASIN and really fill the warehouse with that and bring value to Amazon's marketplace and Amazon's like, hey, this is a good item. We've got good distribution across the country on this. There's a lot of sellers contributing here and you're in the middle of the buy box and your stuff is sitting in a warehouse near someone who needs it right now, well, their buy box is going to show your price, not the lowest price on the West Coast, but a price higher than that because you're in a warehouse near the customer, let's say on the East Coast, same zip code. There's your two or three units sitting in their warehouse. They're going to buy yours. They want to prime now, two hours from now. The buy box fluctuates wildly at any given time across different cities, across different regions. It's not one set line on a keep a graph. That's not the buy box. The buy box is all over the place any given time on any given ace, and especially if it's a fast mover. So please keep that in mind when you're storefront stocking. Another thing to keep in mind when you look into other seller stores is you don't know which one of their winners and which ones they're just trying to liquidate and get rid of because it's a dog. So if you think, oh, I'm going to go copy everything this guy's buying and I'm going to just underprice him by a penny and I'll have a great business. Well, no, probably 20% of his catalog right now is stuff he's just trying to get rid of because he he overbought during Q4, <laughs> right? So you're crazy to go out and try to buy everything. You're going to have to do your own research. It's not some kind of cheat code to look at another seller's store. There's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. He's got unique advantages that you may or may not have. He's got sourcing partnerships, long-time, long-term relationships, local connections that allows him to get the inventory when he needs it. And you're going to struggle to even find it. He's selling the 15-ounce version and you can't find that anywhere in the stores. All they got in the stores is a 12-ounce version. How is he doing that? You don't know. You don't care. So storefront stocking isn't some kind of magic formula, nor is it a gray area that you need to avoid. Jim, I'm new. Should I do some storefront stocking? Absolutely, you should. Look at what other sellers are selling. Look at their stores. Investigate what inventory they have. See if you can figure out a way to sell alongside them. Just don't drop the price into the mud. When you do, everyone will thank you for that because it helps keep that ASIN alive and active and, and profitable and the customers are happy to pay a higher price. That's why the price existed to begin with. Hey, don't be the guy that drives it into the dirt. No need to do that. But that'll always happen. Other people will always do it. I've been doing this for 20 years. If it's a good product, it'll be back. And keep in mind, replens is one of a couple dozen different ways you can make money on Amazon creatively. This is just the beginner model. So I covered 10 gray areas 
of the beginner basic Amazon selling model that we love to teach to our new students. And if you want to hear, like I mentioned earlier, if you want to hear dozens of recent examples of interviews with stories of students from our community, proven Amazon course students who are using these exact strategies every day to build beautiful businesses, well, just keep listening to this podcast. Scroll back in time, listen to 10, 15, 30 episodes. You're going to hear all kinds of great examples of real people who in most cases knew very little to nothing in most cases, had never made significant money online before. And now they've built a beautiful business. And they're starting to learn some of these lessons. Many of the lessons I covered today, I guarantee you, there's sellers who've been selling on Amazon for two, three, four years, and they've never heard an intelligent debate or discussion on any of these topics. These just happen to be some of the more popular ones that do pop up from time to time. But none of us know all there is to know, myself included. The stuff I don't know is wildly longer list than the stuff I do know when it comes to selling physical products online. And I've been doing it 20 years. I'm always learning, always teaching, always surrounding myself with people smarter, more experienced than I am in different areas. And I absorb that. And I communicate that out to you as best as I possibly can. But this is a learning and a leadership journey. You're always going to be learning. You're always going to be improving your leadership skills. You're always going to be adding new relationships to your business. And to the degree that you do that, you're going to build something pretty special. Well, hey, this is my invitation from me to you. If you haven't heard me say it yet, I want you to come to Columbus, Ohio, July 6th through 8th. Bring your family, even if they're not involved in your business. There's plenty of stuff to do. They're welcome to attend with you, by the way, the opening ceremony on the first day, the optional praise and worship evening before the event. That would be July 5th, the evening of July 5th, 2023, Columbus, Ohio. Come, all are welcome. We have a Sunday morning service on the 9th, July 9th, 2023. Welcome to join us there. And there's other sessions on the calendar where you don't have to be registered to attend. One of them is my wife's session, for example, where she talks about what it's like to be in an entrepreneurial household where there's a business and homeschoolers, everyone's packed under the same roof. We're together all the time. Or what's it like to be married to an entrepreneur? She's an artistic type, you know, left brain, right brain brain kind of stuff. So he talks about what's it's like to have the entrepreneur married to the non-entrepreneur and just open discussion. It's a great session. Your spouse, if they come with you and they're not entrepreneurial, they'd love hanging out with that group. It's always, it's probably the most lighthearted group. They have a really good time. So bring your spouse. They can hang out. Lots for them to do in the city. They've got a beautiful zoo in Columbus, Ohio as well. So plan to come in a day or two early stay a day or two late. We're hearing from some people saying, hey, they actually plan to travel on July 4th, which isn't a bad day to travel because most people who are traveling for the holiday, they either travel on the 3rd or the 5th. So if you actually travel on July 4th, which is a major US holiday, you're going to have a pretty easy time getting to the airports. But that's just a little heads up. Hey, we'd love to have you come. Love to see your family there. The website is The Proven Conference. Go there to get all your details, theprovenconference.com. Three words, The Proven Conference. Dot com. We've got a scholarship too. We've still got slots available thanks to our generous sponsors who have given us a nice pool of funds to allow many sellers to attend at no charge. And we still have those slots available. Hey, if you signed up for a scholarship and haven't heard yet, please contact our team because we've reached out to everyone and given them an answer at this point who's signed up so far, but there's still slots available. So go to theprovenconference.com slash scholarship, fill out the short five or six question form there and answer with sincerity. We're going to, to contact you and follow up with you. And we'd love to bless you with free general admission tickets for you and any guests. If you qualify, we'd love to hear from you on that. So if finances are a bit of a challenge, but you'd love to be there, please come. Can't wait to see this event unfold. We've got 40 great breakout sessions this year. I think it's going to blow your socks off. This is the 11th time we've done it. This will be our best. I'm con- completely convinced it hasn't even happened yet. It will be our best ever. All right. God bless you, Business Building Warrior. Let's wrap this episode up. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. It was truly a pleasure spending some time with you. Hopefully you picked up a few new ideas. If you want to discuss any of these, jump into our free Facebook group. We'd love to have a conversation about anything I brought up today, or just do a keyword search on any of these topics. For example, if you go in to our Facebook group. There's a link at silentgym.com, free Facebook group, 73,000 members. Let's say you type in the phrase books. You can see great conversations about people talking about selling books, why they got into it, why they got out of it, how it's going. So find some of these conversations that have already happened 
And then if you've got some questions that you can't easily find answers to with the search feature, well, just go ahead and ask your question. You'll get a great conversation of your own going. That's why it's there. We've got a team of a hundred of us that moderate that group in any given week, hundreds and hundreds of posts happening and different conversations happening. I like to go live on Mondays, by the way, as well, 5 p.m. Eastern time, which is New York time, 5 p.m. I tend to go live in the group, look for announcements on that where we can interact like on the Zoom screen and turn on your camera and we can talk and you can ask questions. We've got some of those episodes coming, by the way, as podcast episodes too, some of the really good questions that people are asking. But all right, enough announcements, enough rambling from me. This was a great episode. Thanks for hanging out with me. Let me know what you thought. If you've never left us a review on iTunes, that'd be great. Five stars. As mama always said, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say say anything at all, please. That would be great. But five-star reviews are certainly appreciated. And uh, that helps us spread the word. Leave a written review or subscribe if you've never subscribed before. That is how iTunes recognizes the hot episodes and the the hot podcasts from the ones that are cooling is how many people are subscribing. So that really helps boost us in the ranks. We appreciate if you subscribe on iTunes. That always pays big dividends because it's is a completely free podcast. We have a $0 marketing budget. doesn't cost you anything and we're not putting any money into marketing it. So you are our marketing. Thanks for that. All right, I promise I was wrapping it up here. Let's finish this one out. We'll have another great episode for you again very soon. I'll talk to you then. 